welcome back to the channel. This is Bruce of Vibowski Studio. My plan today was to go out for some plein air painting, but there's a high chance of rain, probably about 70%. So I'm going to spend that time in the studio working on older plein air sketches I've done in the field. This one today, I've done a video on in the past. So it should be some fun, and I want to take you along on a journey. Let's get started. So for any of you out there that go out and do plein air painting, we all know that not everyone is successful. Last year, I went through a stack of paintings and picked out the ones that I thought had potential and that I could bring to completion, which is one we're working on today. Now, usually when I go out playing around painting, I'll take a photo of the scene when I arrive, especially if uh, you have a lot of cloud action coming and going. You know, I can seize those light and shadow elements quickly in case, like now, I'm going to work on it later in the studio and it's just for reference and then I start the painting. In this case I actually can't remember unless I watch the video if I took a reference photo for this painting. I usually try to like I just mentioned but I with this painting I'm just going to go with my memory and for what the painting needs to make it interesting and make it a painting. Here's the plein air painting I'm going to be working on today. And here's the state that it looks like when I get it home from outside. You can see how thin the paint layers are. And that's usually what I do when I'm painting outdoors. I'm just looking for some accurate color notations. Not really heavy duty paint application. It very rarely happens for me. So this is what the process is going to be about for my plein air work. I'm going to work on getting that thicker paint application and deciding what's going to make this a better painting. It could be removing a tree, and I do remove some stuff in this painting that if you continue watching, you'll see later on in the video. But all I'm looking to do when I revisit my plein air work is I want to resaturate you know, a lot of times I tend to work a little more in a natural, very naturalistic uh, way. And a lot of times the colors that I'm duplicating from a plein air sketch are kind of very uh, gray and not very saturated. A little more neutral, that's what I'm looking for. So I want to be able to decide when I bring it home and in a different light source that's a little more realistic. The painting is going to be hanging in someone's home. So there is that. I want to then make decisions like, oh, I need to saturate this element here, tone this one down here, and of course, uh, you know, want to reestablish my focal point, which is different in every painting. And uh, of course, in this painting, it's the light on the houses. I want to get that color to really feel like it's warm sunlight, and it can be a challenge sometimes. In the past, I've even experimented with taking some plein air sketches that I like certain parts, and maybe I felt the composition was a little off, and because I paint on panels, I just figured out the composition I wanted to use out of that particular painting and cut it down to size, recreating a new composition. So you really, you always have to be willing to, to experiment and grow and be willing to destroy painting. Uh, like I was mentioning, you know, these paintings are doing nothing but sitting around in the studio and sometimes for months. Um, I don't necessarily finish a painting and then rush right home in, and in a few days, once the paint's tacked up or dry, uh, go back in with second layer. I tend to do pretty good with remembering the key elements that attract me to a particular painting. Uh, so waiting a little bit, a few months, is is doesn't really interrupt my thought process. What can also happen by revisiting your older work and taking chances and trying to improve on the painting, it works out, say you got a nice composition and you really like the new colors that you've established or reestablishing the colors uh, from the original, you may want to enlarge that. You may say, oh, I want to make that a bigger composition now, which sometimes can uh, require its own demands. There may be certain other elements on a bigger scale that uh, you need to add to keep the interest, but that's that's the whole 
thing about being an artist, you know, is uh, exploring and seeing the possibilities. On my last video, I mentioned about possibly doing some uh, live stream sessions, and I've done a little research, and at this point in time, I think the demands of time is going to be uh, really hard to uh, to do for me. Working full-time, it's very difficult. It is in the back of my mind to do that. I think it would make a... Uh, interesting kind of segments to you know be able to do a live stream meet some of you you folks out there watch my channel and uh, kind of have a conversation about art and all that good stuff so it's still kind of there on the burner and I'm working at it and seeing what how I can fit that in but at this moment I don't see it happening in in the short term Now, of course, in this process, I'm just trying to also find a balance of how much detail I want to put in. Like working on a roof here, you know, I didn't want to just reestablish the gray that I had in there before. I want to try to create some variation of tone to give that visual interest and to uh, give it a little suggested detail. And uh, that's always a challenge for me sometimes because, you know, I see something, I'm like, oh, I can replicate that, I can paint that. But that's not always the goal, of course. You want to really try to maintain your focus on your your uh, your your focal point in the painting and try to let everything else that doesn't feed into that kind of become a, a secondary actor. You don't want two main actors in, in, in a scene that you're doing, in my opinion, you know, for a painting. So those are things to uh, contemplate as we're working on our oil paintings. Now, of course, I'm just uh, working on getting that shadow side of that building in on the right. And one of the things you want to observe to give that realism to your paintings is look for those little opportunities. In this case, it's going to be a little bit of reflected light bouncing off the building on the left, going back into the shadow of the one I'm working on. So those are little, little things that can really add some dimension to your paintings if that's what you're trying to achieve in your work. Of course, there's many different styles of paintings, but this is how I paint. Uh, one of the things I, I mentioned before, too, in my last video, I am still considering uh, working on some very kind of longer format pieces, really walking you through the process, especially for if you're a beginner painter out there and you watch my channel. Thank you, by the way, for anyone new watching. I really appreciate it. Hope you're liking the content. Uh, is I want to have that total walkthrough of the process of picking a surface to, to uh, work on, uh, doing the gesso, uh, doing the whole kind of picking out your palette, your brushes, all that kind of material thing, and then actually doing a painting. And uh, I think that'll be very useful. And I want to kind of do it in a way that I do a kind of a simple scene of a barn and present uh, how I would paint that scene if I was a beginner. And then I would like people out there to also paint that scene and kind of send those images to me so we can share them in another video and we can talk about that in the process. I think it'd be fun. Let me know what you think in the comments. I just want to take a moment and thank everyone for watching my videos. I really appreciate it. If you were new, checking out my channel for the first time, thank you very much. I invite you to subscribe. If you do so, hit that bell notification icon. I'll let you know when I post new videos. Everyone can also follow me on my Habowski Studio page on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram at Habowski Studio. On the screen now, you also see my website, www.habowskistudio.com. I'm just working on the shadows right now. I'm trying to establish some nice shapes 
and it's really going to be affected of course by the tree casting them over to the right and you'll see me make some adjustments on that later uh, thing with shadows that I found useful is obviously depending on how far away an object is casting a shadow the shadow edges will be pretty pretty light pretty on the edges will be pretty uh, soft if the object is closest to where the shadow is then it's going to be a little harder and one one way you can see this is when uh, where I used to live you had I had a tree and the way the leaves from two different trees that were a little far apart when they cast over each other the pattern of, of the leaves you could distinctly see differences in the shadow it's really fascinating now I'm just going to work on some of the grass right in here reestablish the shadows and I am going to cool this a little bit using uh, cobalt blue some uh, cad yellow light a little bit of white in the mixture and when I get to the cool tones I've used the same mixture minus the white and added a little bit of reddish color I had for the roof up here and I'm going to be to temper it a little bit so it's not too garish. So let's see how I like this. I can always modify it once I get the color on there. And there was a rock wall right in here, but I think it's a little hard to explain and kind of doesn't allow the viewer to go into the painting so I think I'm going to get rid of that. Debating right now, keeping this part, maybe have a little flowers planted there, but then it'd be in the center of the panel. So I'm going to take out these rocks. I still feel that, that the tone of the green is a little rich, adding a little more white. Test that next to there. Uh, much better. So I can go into the other section when I get some more white into the mixture. Grasses have all different colors. It depends on what kind of grass it is and different elements. You know, if it's grass that's not tended to, like out in a field, you know, you're going to have more probably naturalistic gray tones, but People tend to take care of the lawn, so there is that. And I can always modify this. It's easier to have it be a little, maybe oversaturated sometimes. And knock it down with a little bit of red in there or different other colors. So I'm not going to worry about it too much right now. Just get these rocks painted over. And because I worked in a thinner layer before. I don't have big, if I did palette knife rocks or something of that nature, I would have to sand this down a bit to be able to do what I'm doing now of just painting over the rocks. And again, I'm just getting some base green on here that is cooler. And I want to kind of get a bigger picture and then I'll very, you know, put variations with uh, some warm tones here and there to neutralize. Maybe introduce a little bit of burnt sienna in spots with the green. I'll decide that as I get the major shape and tone of this in. This is like a kind of a overall middle value of the green I can push and pull from here. So that's what I'm talking about what I was mentioning earlier about changing things, taking things out, taking out that rock wall I think really helped open up the painting a little bit. And I might add just a little piece of it back in on the left hand side. I'm not sure yet. Now normally I might try to when when I start trying to blend the edges of the lighter tone grass with the darker I'll try to do that with this sort of synthetic flat or synthetic brush. But once I get this laid in here for the shadow, I'm going to try to use a dry, softer brush 
to work the edges along here to really give that soft light effect. And that's kind of what we have to do. Do a lot of observation. I find myself when I'm driving to work or driving home or out for a walk, I do that. I, I'll look at light situations, especially in late afternoon light, looking at tones on a tree trunk, for instance, and try to simulate in my mind how what colors would I use to paint that? How would I achieve that? And keeping that, that thought process of active in your daily life, even though you're not painting, I found has been very helpful for when I do put brush to canvas or panel. So this is the uh, brush I'll be using to blend some of those edges now. And very soft, totally dry. And the key is going to be, as you make a few passes, you'll have to wipe off the excess paint that might capture from the lighter tone. So we'll see how this goes. I don't use it super often, but it can be very effective. You'll see here that the key is going to be having that super dry brush, no paint in it, and you're just barely, barely touching the surface of your uh, painting. And you can see I'm wiping some of the, as I make a few drag passes, I'm wiping off some of the excess. And eventually you'll have to clean out the brush, but you want to try to minimize that as much as possible. Now often in nature, unless the trees or bushes are very dense, you're not going to have a solid uh, sort of a mass. Now we're going to work on putting a few little other lighter tone grass areas within here to break that up a bit and add a little more interest. And we can also start maybe shaping this edge seems a little too straight across. So things like that we're going to, need to uh, adjust right now. And when you do this, you can only get by with a couple marks. And then you'll have to wipe off your brush a bit with a paper towel or clean it with some turpentine. And if you do that with the turpentine, you want to make sure to really get that moisture out. And the paint I have mixed up is uh, fairly dense without it being uh, thinned out with medium. So I just got to decide where I want to make adjustments and plant the brush. And then I can turn and get the other corner, turn the brush, and add another little. Now I need to take off that excess paint, dip back into. By wiping off with the paper towel, it will facilitate you not having to clean your brush often and getting it potentially too moist with the, uh, I use terpenoid, uh, Gamsol I mean. Just break it up enough, add interest. Now I'll bring in a few, in one second here, fix that over there. And by dabbing the brush a bit, I can adjust an edge. I just think it, the shadows a nice, uh, leads the eye past the foreground into the background. I think it's a nice effect. Now we'll add a few sky holes in the mass of the grassy area. Now you notice I'm leaving them for the moment. I'll take that soft haired brush in a moment and soften them. And you don't want those colors too light. They'll seem pasted on. But you're going to be adjusting that a little bit when it's it's on wet paint. So by the time you get the soft brush on there, that'll tone that down just a bit. But kind of like that. I'm going to add a little different shape of shadow over here. Just was bugging me on the edge. Okay. And a little right there. So I'm going to take a minute from the painting to demonstrate uh, how I clean my brushes because I've seen some, in my opinion, some uh, poor habits out there of how people clean their equipment.
and I've been doing this for years and it really extends the life of the brushes. We're going to uh, simulate that I'm cleaning this brush that I just used for the grass. And because I'm going to be a little harsh, I don't want to actually use the brush, but the idea of cleaning would be for any brush, but this one particularly when you have delicate hairs and you want them to always point very nicely and not get splayed out. And uh, this comes from how I would see some students in workshops have taught how they clean their brushes. So, the first thing I do every time like I'm cleaning a brush, and I actually have two jars in the studio. This is my dirty turp jar that we're using for this demonstration. But I have two jars that would clean initially with the dirty jar and then final rinse in the cleaner turpentine. So, assuming this is dirty, first thing I do is wipe off the excess with a paper towel of any paint. Just, I don't ever, I don't ever scrub like that, even with brushes like this. I'm very particular. I don't think over the life of the brush that's very good. I pinch and pull. Turn. You can even you can even twist a bit to get the dry paint off. And then one dip into the turp, wipe off again, very carefully squeezing the excess paint out. And then I'll lightly go left to right over my coil in the jar, kind of squeegeeing some of the paint off on the side, and do that with the brush to get it clean. And then I'll do the final rinse in my regular jar. Now what you don't want to do, you would do the same technique with the detail brush I just used, very lightly going over that coil, but usually I'm not jamming a lot of paint in my smaller brush, so uh, it won't take much to clean it. But you never want to take that smaller brush and like rinse it and then smash it on a paper towel to clean it. Never ever do that. I think it's a poor abuse of your brush and short life. Okay, let's get back to painting. Yeah, when I did uh, taught workshops and stuff, I'd see artists you know, they're bringing their, their brushes to class and and they were just all splayed apart and very poorly kept. I saw a lot of, a lot of uh, that habit and just carrying them around too. I'd see people like a little toolbox and the brushes are just sliding back and forth. And of course the hairs, wherever the edge of the box is or whatever, are bumping that and over time getting ruined. Never mind the painting process that isn't really effective for them. So now I'm going to be working on reestablishing some of the uh, leaves in here. And I'm using sort of a stiff synthetic, not much bend. The idea being that I'll pat the brush into the paint that I've mixed up, tap it on a paper towel a little bit, and try to dry brush and see different techniques can work. I'm trying this first, see what I get for a result. Kind of hard to see anything probably on camera here. I just don't know if I want it too thick. There'll be some cutting around to establish some of the tree shapes too, like cutting in the sky. Typical ideas there. Usually what I find helps is when I'm painting, if I can try to get at least three values in a area of a painting, you know, whatever section of the painting shape, dark, light, medium tone, that'll help right off in describing some form. But with leaves, it's a little different. There is no strong cubicle, conical, or rectang you know, uh, rectangular shapes. It's kind of a uh, 
finding that technique you want to do to represent the leaves can be a little bit of a challenge on occasion. That'll help tie it together a little bit too, but just dancing around. And I think once I start cutting around, like there's some elements here, the tree is forward. So I want to have some leaves come over this right here, I think, to add some dimension to the scene. And of course, because they painted there, you could try to wipe some of that out. I'm just using a little thicker paint. And I think this particular area anyway is going to require a couple passes. Then hopefully I can, here and there in key areas, put in some darker flex here and there to suggest the multitude of leaves. Sometimes you'll find that this kind of process of what I'm working on right now with the tree shapes is a push and pull. You're painting sometimes the, of course, leaves, the positive, and then cutting in the sky, the negative, to find a happy medium to suggest what you want to suggest in a particular scene. But I'm talking about certain elements like you know, in this case, there's a house behind that tree, so I don't want to lose that house shape too much. So there's a balance, like I'll have to start working on the roof line in here to uh, suggest the roof going off in perspective. So I'll have to decide how much of that roof I want to put in. So let's continue. I know this can seem like a lot of information, and it's a process. You know, I think this part of the painting was the hardest for me, was deciding how to handle that tree how many leaves to put in, all that kind of uh, sort of thing, and going back and forth. That's really what the painting's about, Like especially when you're painting, I find anyway, for me, if I'm painting trees and leaves, uh, finding that balance of going back and forth with the sky holes and, and the tree sh uh, leaf shapes, and trying not to muddy the sky color, or making the leaf color too milky because some of the blue sky got into the green. I think it would be beneficial for someone to take some like reference photos they take of trees and stuff and just do little tiny five by seven studies of edges and how you would do your sky holes to not look pasted on. I think that's a really good exercise. I've done that a long time ago in the past just to get an idea. So if you're working on a bigger piece, you're not going to uh, ruin it or that sort of idea. You want to kind of uh, practice a little technique and then try it out on the larger format one. Just slowly working away, identifying, pulling out some of the tree limbs, some more of the leaf shapes, and reestablishing where I painted over part of the house. I didn't want to lose too much of the house, so working on that and trying to be very direct with my strokes. Sometimes you just got to step back and let it sit for a while and let it grow on you. Now I'm just kind of just kind of working on that tree a little bit, identifying some other parts of the tree so it's not uh, all kind of uh, separate out from the rest of the painting. I want to kind of tie it in, try to finish up some shapes I want to do for the leaves and working on the trunk and all that good stuff. You can take a little break from the uh, trees. Start like working on some windows over here. I got to bring into more completion. And there's a few other details I want to work on. Like we want this window is a little higher, just a smidge. I know it sounds petty, maybe, to some, but, you know, if you're trying to work realistically, you still have some parameters that you have to work within, even if you want it to be a loose painting. And one of the things that I don't feel you could fudge on too much, I mean, never say never, is windows. And, you know, certain times, uh, you know, they're spaced out evenly, not like down here though, I mean that's, but typically in these style houses up here in Maine, they have these windows up top and they're spaced out evenly, of course. And that one was just a little bit taller, so that little cutoff can really help. And one thing I've talked about in the past in my videos is tangents. So we have this shadow ending, I mean, you get the shadow of the trees and stuff. And we want to I just think it's important to continue on something. Don't leave it hanging, so to speak. And I think it looks odd if it just stops. Just 
slightly. Don't go too far because the brush is getting muddied and don't break it up too much. You want to have a little more complete shape. Yeah, it's good enough. This tree is casting that light a little bit. So of course it's not going to be an exact match. Um, you know, you can really get into some perspective and all kinds of details that in the end no one's really going to know but because I did adjust a fair amount of tree a little bit it is kind of for lack of a better term scraggly I am going to introduce some more pockets of the side of the house in sunlight because I think there's too much of a mass of the tree in conjunction with the laciness of the the lacy effect of the leaves in the tree there so I'm going to do my best here to try to mimic more openness in the tree shape and it's something that while I'm doing the video I can work on and get pretty close I'll still once this dries study it and see if I'm happy with the end result it may re this is going to require require a uh, third session once some of the paint layers dry just trying to simulate sorry sometimes it's hard to talk and paint at the same time but step back and study that and See if it's going to need something else down the road. But for now, I think I'm going to maybe leave it. I don't want to get too caught up in one element for too long. But I think it suggests enough. That's what you're kind of after sometimes. Now working on the tree like I am, I'm trying to really find some interesting shapes for the limbs to make some nice negative positive shapes. Hope you guys are really liking the content I'm putting out on channel. Really appreciate everybody out there that's kind of uh, been watching my videos. And again, if you're new, checking it out for a first time, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your opinions on what you think of the content. Just Detailing out the tree, trying to get some uh, interesting kind of effects in between the limbs of the tree and the sky shapes, uh, negative, positive, and uh, make it a little interesting to look at. Now working on that part of the painting that you just saw on the house, the left hand side where it meets the little L sticking out, there's some construction angles that I want to investigate. The place that you know, where I painted this is not too far from where I live. So I'm going to stop by there on the way home from work and study that a little more because there's some accuracy I want to get in the connection of the two buildings and not make it look odd. Because, again, I'm working realistically, so I have to pay attention to some parameters. I have found myself lately when I'm working on my paintings, I get to a certain point and I kind of... Uh, exit from the factual information of the scene and I start thinking about is there some kind of narrative that I can add to it is there something that will make it more interesting than what was originally there sometimes that might be changing a little bit of the original color of an element in the scene or whatever and I find that makes it a little more interesting to stay engaged with the painting I don't want to lose my interest in the subject and I think that really kind of helps quite a bit. When I paint my buildings and such, even with my urbans, I'm not looking for architectural rendering. I'm trying to add some life to the subject and make it interesting. But there are certain things that need to be in place to make it believable. What can be challenging when you do that, of course, is deciding what to put in there. And there could be a whole selection that you can choose. And that, that becomes the challenge a little bit. But also the key for me is not to overdo it, just a little bit here and there. And uh, something to think about when you're 
doing your own work, is there something that starts to tell a story? Because usually sometimes I'm just attracted by the light hitting the side of a building or something of that nature. Just kind of, again, like I mentioned before, I think this is the most challenging part of the painting for me, deciding how much how, how much I want to simplify that tree and also not trying to make the shapes too similar. The human mind tends to want to do that, kind of create a pattern and then leaves. I want it to be more organic and more uh, like a little bit of organized chaos from nature in those shapes. And try and find, maintain that house behind the tree. I don't want to lose too much of that, like I mentioned also. It's, it can be a struggle because I, I always want to put in strong shadows on something and tree shapes, tree with the leaves, you can't. Now just some pops of color to add a little more interest to the scene and I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing this one and trying to bring it to life. Let me know what you thought in the comments. I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to be uh, wrapping up this video now. A few layers have to dry. There might be a few touch-ups, very minor. Might do a third session, uh, highlighting a few things and add those in. And I'm going to talk about those right now. Okay, let's talk about it for a moment here. I do like how I push the deep blue in the sky. I think it really pops the shapes forward. There's a few things I'm going to do once uh, this paint layer dries. I'm going to do a little more in the tree highlight the leaves on the tree here and uh, I pretty much like everything else added of course the flowers that little pop of color right now over in the trees it's a little too wet right now so I wanted to let that dry really like how the grass came out with the cast shadows of a group of uh, trees over here in the backside adds a nice kind of uh, element to lead the viewer into the scene. Okay, so that's going to wrap up this uh, painting session here and the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the comments. Pretty quick about responding. And uh, thanks for joining me. See you in the next one.